Hey everyone. In this video, I want to explore Azure Firewall, a deep dive into Azure Firewall, both the standard features and the new premium features. I'm gonna do lots of demos along the way. As always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment, and share really is appreciated, and hit that bell icon to get notified of new content. So Azure Firewall, this is a fully managed cloud-native firewall appliance. It's designed to protect my virtual network-based resources. Now, it is stateful, so it's understanding, hey, this flow went out, we're expecting this return traffic. It can support availability zones, so I can actually have them distributed for higher resilience. And it's going to auto-scale based on the actual amount of traffic it's handling. So its big focus really is the inspection of the traffic going in and out of my virtual network, but also east, west within my virtual network and between kind of peered virtual networks. Now with that said, it can be used to actually offer services out to the internet. And I'll show this. But really there are better solutions if I'm trying to offer kind of HTTP, HTTPS, those kind of layer seven to something else. We have, for example, Azure App Gateway. That app gateway with the web application firewall is really just a richer solution when I want to offer services out that are kind of layer seven. Could I do it with Azure Firewall? Absolutely, and I'll kind of show some of those DNAT rules and where we might use Azure Firewall. But if it's kind of that layer seven, I'm probably gonna to wanna to use app gateway instead. Another important factor to remember when I talk about all of this is traffic is denied by default. So I actually have to go and open this up to allow traffic to flow via the Azure Firewall. Now I mentioned already there's kind of two SKUs. So we have kind of the standard SKU. So that's really where we previously before just had Azure Firewall, that's now Azure Firewall standard. And then we now have this premium SKU as well, which builds on top of standards. So all of the features in standard are there in premium as well, but then it uses kind of more powerful virtual machines to power the actual Azure Firewall, and it adds additional layers of actually functionality. One thing to bear in mind, and it's kind of interesting, especially if you're using this in a demo environment, it is actually possible to kind of stop and start Azure Firewall either one of these. Now there's kind of PowerShell to do this. I'll have the link uh, in the description below in, in for the video. But if we actually jump over super quick, it's in the FAQ. And it actually shows us the PowerShell to both deallocate and allocate the Azure Firewall. Now, you do have to be super careful with this. Because obviously realize what I'm going to end up doing, I'm gonna draw this out, is Azure Firewall will kind of be between all of my different traffic flows. Well, if I shut it down, nothing's gonna flow anymore. So while yes, I can stop and stop paying for it, realize if you do stop it, nothing's gonna flow. But in a lab environment, that might be fine. Now, when I talk about the pricing, it's really built around two factors. So I can think about, well, I pay kind of this deployment per deployment hour. And you can see here, there's this standard. They've not updated actually this pricing calculator. Premium is GA now. This premium, I think, is kind of half the price of what it actually is. So it's showing me, hey, it's a 50% discount right now. But it has gone GA. They just need to update this. So I think this will be 175 uh, per deployment hour. And then you pay for the data processed. So for every gigabyte processed, it's kind of one and a half pennies, essentially. And the reason we get that is because, again, it's going to auto scale. So as we think about, hey, more traffic's going through, it's going to auto scale the actual number of instances to make sure it can actually map um, the amount of traffic going through. So from a pricing perspective, hey, uh, yes, I'm going to pay for kind of this base configuration and I pay for the traffic that's actually processed. So what I wanna quickly do is talk about the setup I have to try and frame how we're actually gonna use the Azure Firewall. And my setup is pretty common 
except I'm actually spanning regions. Now, typically what you will do for Azure Firewall is I would have a deployment per region. Um, just for performance sake, I don't really want the latency addition of my traffic going to another region and maybe coming back. So I, I'm probably going to have a deployment per region. Now, if it's a small, hey, I may absolutely use an Azure Firewall in another region. But in my deployment right here, I can really think about, I have this kind of hub virtual network. So I have kind of this hub VNet, and mine is this 10.0 slash 16. So kind of we're focusing on that 10.0 part there. And then what I have is two spoke virtual networks. So I kind of have this spoke over here, which is actually kind of East US. So this is a 10.1 slash 16. And then I have another spoke over here, which is 10.3. So I have these basically three virtual networks that have been play in this configuration. And in each of these, I've kind of got a, an infrastructure subnet. The subnet is important because that's where we're going to deal with kind of some of the routing that we're going to apply. And then the way this actually deploys is, well, Azure Firewall is going to get deployed into that hub. Now, these appeared. which means traffic can kind of flow between these. But remember, peering is not transitive. So these cannot talk to each other. They don't have a direct peer. And ordinarily, there's nothing in here that would facilitate these being able to communicate to each other. Now, for my Azure Firewall, it deploys into its own subnet. So I can think about drawing kind of its own subnet in here. And that's actually going to be my Azure. So it has a set name, Azure Firewall Subnet. And this needs to be a slash 26. That gives it enough room to grow as it kind of builds out based on what's happening. I can only have one Azure Firewall per virtual network. But again, multiple virtual networks can share that Azure Firewall. Uh, and I'm going to show that. Now, one point. If you're doing this kind of peering configuration, and you want the peers to be able to talk to each other via this, make sure in your peering configuration, you allow forwarded traffic, i.e. traffic not originating from the virtual network, because otherwise, it won't route. So what do I mean by that? If we quickly jump over, because I wasted about two hours on this. I forgot I changed this settings when I originally set this up. So here, I need to go and select the spoke virtual networks. So if I quickly just jump over, and on each of the spokes, so I'll select, for example, East US, go to the peerings, and this is the peering from the spoke to the hub. I need to make sure I'm allowing traffic forwarded from the remote virtual network. So it's forwarding from that hub from possibly other virtual networks. So here it's saying, hey, allowed forwarded traffic from SUS, SCUS, which is the hub. I'm not originating from that hub, i.e. a different peer into this. So I must have that setting. So that's kind of an important point or, again, various things won't work. You also want to make sure in your configuration that if you have network security groups, they're not conflicting because those will apply as well. So I'm going to set up rules in my Azure Firewall, but if I've got network security groups applying as well, well, if they're blocking traffic, but the firewall allows it, it still won't go. Likewise, if I have virtual machines that have a firewall inside the OS, they need to allow that traffic as well. It's very much a cumulative effect. So Azure Firewall itself is actually built around virtual machine scale sets. So when I deploy the Azure Firewall, what it's actually doing is it's deploying kind of this virtual machine scale set. And that's what actually gives me kind of this auto scale. So because it's built on VMSS, based on the workload that's happening, it can scale the number of instances accordingly. Now, initially, in terms of the throughput, 
I think it's built around kind of 2.5 to 3 um, uh, gigabits per second, but can actually grow to 30 gigabits per second. So that's with the auto scale can grow. And at 60% utilization of its current number of instances, it will do those auto scales to make sure it can kind of keep up with the utilization. Obviously, that takes a few minutes to actually happen. And the way it's actually surfaced is, well, it, it's using the Azure Load Balancer. So I can think about, well, now we don't see any of this. This is kind of hidden from us. But absolutely, there's kind of an Azure Load Balancer there. And the important thing we need to know, this has kind of this internal firewall IP, an IP address from the virtual network I've deployed it to. And this is what I need to know time and time again. I need to tell things, hey, go to this IP address over here. Now, additionally, it is going to have a public. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Additionally, it's going to have a public IP address as well. And that's what it's actually going to use for kind of NAT configuration. So if I think about, OK, there's also going to be a public IP. Now, I'm saying public IP. It can actually be multiple. It can actually be up to 250. So I can really add a lot of public IPs to this. But I can think about, obviously, it's a separate low answer, but it's all going through these mechanisms, and that's how I'm actually going to go and communicate with it. Now, these instances themselves have a single NIC most of the time. If I do kind of forced tunneling, then it actually deploys a second NIC. I'll actually have a second subnet, which it uses for its management traffic, because it still has to be able to get to the control plane, to actually function. So if I actually do false tunneling, I do this at deployment time, there'll be a second subnet as well for the firewall management. So that's kind of a key point. And the reason that single NIC is important, if you watch my highly available NVA talk, it's all about getting that symmetric routing, which is super important for a stateful firewall. Now I'm gonna show my demos through the portal I can use ARM templates, I can use PowerShell, I can use the Azure CLI. There's a whole bunch of these that I can do. It's just the portal is more intuitive, it makes it easier for me to actually show it. So I can think about, hey, we have these different uh, mechanisms here. So when I deploy this thing, it's actually a very simple deployment. I have to pre-create this Azure Firewall subnet. So I create that subnet in my virtual network, I don't want any network security groups on that subnet. It needs to be a slash 26 minimum size to make sure it can grow. Now, one interesting point, when I deploy the Azure Firewall, I have to deploy it to the same resource group that the virtual network is in. It's just one of those things, has to be in the same resource group. So I deploy this and I can show you mine super quickly just so we can see what this looks like. So if I looked at my virtual network, we can see in my subnets, hey, I created at the bottom here this Azure Firewall subnet, a slash 26. And the only actual kind of connected device thing I would see on that, if I look at my 12, is I can actually see the firewall. So that's that internal IP address within that Azure Firewall subnet. Now, if I go and look at my firewall itself, there's actually very little on the firewall. So I can see here, well, I'm a premium SKU. I've kind of got this configured. It shows me the subnet it's deployed to. I can see it's public IP, and I can see it's firewall private IP. So it's showing me the most kind of important information I need. And then, really everything else is set via this kind of firewall policy that we see down here. I actually don't really do anything else at the firewall level. Other than, and I'll talk about this, hey, I can add additional public IPs, and I wanna make sure I set up my diagnostic settings so I'm sending the various logs, let's go back to that second, so actually edit my settings. I want to make sure I'm setting my logs for my application rules, my network rules, my proxy and my metrics to a log analytics workspace. That's going to actually enable me 
to go and query, see what the traffic is from Log Analytics. And there's a whole bunch of different kind of queries built in. So make sure you go and turn on those diagnostic settings. It's gonna be super, super useful. But that, that's really it for the firewall. Um, everything I'm actually going to do is via my policy, and we will actually come back to that. So this is great. I've deployed the thing. It's not configured yet. Um, I have to go and do the policy. But one important thing to realize is this only works if traffic flows via it. Now, this does not work with something like Route Server today. Route Server is based on BGP. This does not support BGP today. So I have to go and tell my other subnets, hey, I want you to send your traffic to this IP, that internal IP of the firewall, as your next hop. Now, the way I've configured it in my environment, I created two route tables. So remember, we use a route table to do user-defined routing. So I can think about on here, I created a route table. And remember, a route table is this user-defined routing. And for this, subnet, I'm actually going to apply it to this subnet, I want everything, internet bound, anything to go to the Azure firewall. So that one, my route is 0, 0, 0, 0, slash 0. And what am I sending it to? Well, it, it's a network virtual appliance. So I want my next hop to be of type network virtual appliance. And the IP address would be that IP address of that firewall. So I'm going to put in the IP address of that internal firewall. And then that route table gets applied to the subnet. Now for my other subnet on this other virtual network, I don't want all traffic to go via the firewall. I only want traffic to go via the firewall if it's trying to get to this IP space. So I create a different route table, I create another one, so again, it's a user-defined routing. And this time it's, hey, if you're trying to get to 10.3, I want you to go to a network virtual appliance, and it's that internal firewall IP. And then I apply it to that subnet. So now what essentially is gonna happen is, hey, if I have a machine here, and it's trying to talk to anything that basically starts with 10.3, it's going to go up via that firewall. So if it's trying to get over here, it knows essentially to go up to that IP, to one of the backend set members, and essentially will go that way. For this subnet, it's just told, hey, everything. So for this one, everything will just always go to that IP address, and it will decide where it goes next. So this is kind of sending all traffic. This is only sending it if it's 10.3 as the destination. So that's how this is configured. So these are route tables to tell it, hey, I want to override the defaults that it learns through peering or whatever gateways. When you're trying to get to here, I actually want you to take this path. This is my next hop. So if I go and look at this quickly, if in my environment I look at my route tables, so you just create these. So for my West Central US, this is where I want everything. So if I look at my routes, I just added a default route of 0, 0, 0, 0, slash 0. It's going to a virtual appliance. And the next top is that 10.0.12.4. Remember, 10.0.12.4 is the internal IP of our firewall, 10.0.12.4. If I look at my other route table for East US, well, for this one, I only want the traffic to go via the firewall if it's trying to get to that other spoke, 10.3.0 to 0 slash 16. Hey, next top, 10.0.12.4. So that, that's really all it's doing. And once you've applied those, you actually link it to subnets. So that route table links to my East US infra subnet. And then that other route table links to my infra subnet on West Central US. So I've got that override of the routing 
actually put in place right there. So that is doing all of that configuration to actually make that work. I can actually go and look at this to make sure those routes are actually in action. So if I was to go and look at one of the virtual machines that are actually on one of those virtual networks, so if we actually jump over to our virtual network for a second, or I could just look at the VM, so if I look at the virtual machine, and I'll pick just that East US one, we can actually scroll down, and if we look at the networking, I can look at its network interface. So uh, I'm actually looking here at its network interface adapter. And if we look at that, if we scroll down, we can look at its effective routes. So I'm looking at this here. And what I'll see is I'll see that route injected in that it's actually getting because of that user-defined route. So we look at all of the routes, most of these are built in. But we can see this one added here, this user for virtual appliance. So now I can see, okay, yeah, look at that. There's this, hey, if it's going to 10.3 slash 16, my next hop is 10.0.12.4, i.e. that Azure Firewall. So that's the setup. So all of this is really just about making sure we have the various things deployed ready to actually do stuff. Okay, so what can I do? Well, the first thing it does is it does provide the routing. So as I talked about, normally different spokes can't communicate. The peering relationship is not transitive. I would actually have to create like a mesh or put an appliance in the hub. Well, you saw I've set up that routing. So for West Central, everything goes via the Azure Firewall. For East US, anything going to 10.3 goes via the Azure Firewall, i.e. between these two subnets, it's going to be symmetric. It's taking the same path in both directions. That's super important, or again, traffic won't flow. My NSGs, although I have NSGs on these subnets, they don't block traffic within the known IP space, i.e. the virtual network, so that's not going to be a problem. And so it enables this communication. Now, it only enables the communication that I enable via rules. And I'm going to show you that in a second. But for now, I have a rule in place to enable things like ICMP so they can ping. So a super, super simple demo is if I jump over really quickly. So this is my virtual machine in West Central US. And I'm going to try and ping a VM in that East US. So if I'm just going to ping 10.1, Dot zero dot 10. So that's going via that Azure Firewall. Hold on. Let me try this one more time. Wrong, wrong IP address. There we go. So we can actually see there it's working. So that's going through the Azure Firewall. Now you notice the latency is quite big. The reason the latency is quite big is remember what I've configured this as is my virtual network, this is in West Central, this is in East US, that is in South Central. And again, normally you would deploy the Azure Firewall kind of per region. But even now, I mean, it's, not, it's not a huge pain, but just realize that's why you're seeing the latency you're seeing. It's not the Azure Firewall adding that big latency, it's because these are actually going across regions. So, make sure you've got that peering configuration to allow from remote um, non-originating VNets. But now, hey, it's enabling that kind of routing between those different spokes. So that, that's one thing it's doing. But then what we really care about, it is a firewall. So the whole point of a firewall is, well, I restrict the traffic I'm allowing. Now, before I actually get to the firewall part of the configuration, I do want to kind of stress this concept we have. And we have this concept called IP groups. And as the name suggests, an IP group lets me just add IP ranges to this IP group. And what that lets me do is I'm essentially defining these IP groups, and then I can use them in all of the different types of rules I'm going to show you. So rather than having to define the IP addresses multiple times in all these different rules, I go and create this IP group, and I create lots of different IP groups with the sets of IP ranges that 
belong to that group. And then it makes it much easier. I'm essentially managing the IP groups and I'm going to use them in all of the rules. So if I was to jump over again for a second, you just go and search for IP groups. And see, I've created two. One is home base. So that's kind of IP addresses that are for the locations I use. And the reason that's useful is then in my rules, I can say, hey, only if the traffic is coming from what is my public facing IP. And then I create another one for the main US kind of VNet IP space. So in here, I just add the IP addresses that I want to be able to kind of talk to each other and use actually through this Azure firewall configuration. So, so that's my goal of having this. So once we've got that concept, so we understand, okay, IP groups, great. I now have to configure my Azure firewall. So we've deployed this Azure firewall. We have this nice Azure firewall deployed. I have to tell it its whole configuration. So we have this AZ firewall. Now, originally with Azure Firewall, there were two different ways I could actually do that configuration. There's kind of these classic rules where I actually define the rules on the firewall itself, or there were these new firewall policies. The firewall policy is its own object. And the great thing about a policy is, hey, I'm going to create this policy. And that policy I can apply to n number of firewalls. So I could think about, yes, I, I create this policy once, I have this one policy, and I can have multiple policies, different configurations, but I can apply it to n Azure firewalls. So I could have, hey, I've got another Azure firewall up here. I could apply that same policy to that one as well. So it simplifies all of my configuration. Now, Azure firewall standard it can use either one. Now, I still recommend you would use the policy, but if we jump over for a second, and if we were going to create a brand new firewall, what you'll notice is it gives me the option of, hey, if I'm standard here, do you want to use firewall policy or use firewall rules to manage this? But if I change it to premium, I don't have that option. I can only use firewall policy if I'm using premium. So that's kind of this key point, and that's the direction going forward. Now, one thing I would say is with the actual firewall policies, there's a billing implication for it. If I, do, if I have a policy and I link it to more than one Azure firewall, then it becomes this billable object. If I create a policy and it's only linked to zero or one, I don't pay for it. So there is a pricing implication of policies. If I go and look at the pricing page, we can actually see it spells this out. So it becomes this Azure Firewall Manager policy is $100 per policy per region. But that pricing only kicks in if it's more than one. So notice it spells this out. No Azure Firewall Manager policy charges will be done for policies that are associated to a single firewall. And it even has a, a little picture here telling you when you would pay for it. So child policy two is only applied to a single firewall. There is no charge for that one. But these other policies that apply to multiple, hey, you're going to pay those $100 per policy per region where it's actually used. So just be aware there is a billing implication of the policies. But if it's only used by one firewall, um, there's no pricing for that. Now, I am going to focus on the policy. Again, I'm focused on premium. That's my deployment. And so with that, I have to use firewall policies. Okay, so what, what is this policy? So the policy is actually made up of a number of logical components. The logical components are really there to help me organize the different rules I'm going to create. Now, there are three different types of rule. There's a DNAT rule, there is a network rule, and there is an application rule. I'm going to go into each of them. Now, at the top level of the policy, I can have one or more rule 
collection groups. And again, I can have another one. So I can have another rule collection group, etc. Within the rule collection group, I have rule collections. Now, the rule collection is of a specific type. So that is going to be DNAT network application. And then it's made up of rules of that particular type. Then I could have a different rule collection, again, of a certain type. The rule collection group can have a mixture of types. It's not set to any particular type. And then all of that could then repeat in the next one. So if we quickly go and look, just so you can see this, so remember, this is not part of the firewall. This is part of the firewall policy. So if I go and look at my firewall policies, here's my policy, we can see, hey, I have my rule collections. Now, the first thing is actually, you can have a parent policy. So I might have a core set of rules that I want to apply everywhere. So what I can do is I can create that policy and then child policies can specify that parent policy. So it will inherit those settings. They will be processed first. So they will take kind of preference over policies I create in this child policy. Note that parent policy is therefore being used when I apply this child policy, i.e. I will pay for that parent policy um, with whatever regions I'm actually using it. Then I have my rule collections. As you can see here, I've got three different rule collection groups. These are actually built in. So it has a default network, application, and DNet. Again, those can contain anything. If I add a new rule collection group, it just wants a name. Now notice it wants a priority as well. So the whole point here is as I'm creating these for rule collection groups and rule collections, I actually give them a priority. And that priority is between 100 to is it 65, 65,000. So you have a big range. The lower the number, the higher the priority. So obviously 100 is kind of the highest. You probably won't use that because then I've got no flexibility in the future. Maybe I start at 1,000 or something. So that has a priority. This has a priority. This has a priority. This new one would have a priority, etc. The rules themselves do not have priorities. They just get used as part of the priority of their parent object. And so the way that is used is hey, the rule collection group with the highest priority, i.e. the lowest number, is processed first. Within that first rule collection group, the rule collection with the highest priority is processed, then the next rule collection in terms of priority and so on. Once they're all processed, then it goes to the next rule collection group. Now, uh, th there is an exception to this in terms of the actual rule types, which I'm going to get to in a second. But for now, think of those priorities as, hey, if I have these groups, that's how I can determine which group is actually applied first. So that's kind of the, the key point around those objects. So if we jump back again. So a rule collection group is just a name and a certain priority. Whereas a rule collection, well, this actually is a type. So I can only add rules of the type of the rule collection. Once again, I add a priority, and then I can add individual rules actually to it. So that's kind of those fundamentals uh, about those organizational structures. So I'm going to create a policy. I create rule collection groups if I don't want to use the default ones, then they're rule collections and I create rules within there. Now I talked about there were kind of the three rule types. So each of those are of one of three. So if I talk about the rule types, and this is actually important in terms of the processing, because the first rule type to get processed is DNAT. So regardless of the actual priorities in here, DNAT rules get processed first. Now, 
whichever one is the highest priority DNAT rule gets processed. It will process all of the DNAT rules first. So all of the DNAT rules will get processed in this order. So the highest rule collection group, then the highest rule. All of the DNAT rules. Once all of the DNAT rules are processed, then, and only after they're all processed, will it then go and process the network rules. So once again, it goes and pulls out all of the network rules in the order of the rule collection group, then the rule collections applies all of them. Lastly, only after they're processed, will it then go and apply the application rules. Again, in the order of the rule collection group, and the rule collections. That's important because if I go and create a whole bunch of application rules with very granular, hey, this fully qualified domain name, this category, etc., then I add some network rule that says allow everything, my application rules will never get used because the traffic is just allowed in because of the network rule. So just be aware those things are actually applying and that's going to kick in. Also, <laughs> Before these network and application rules, threat intelligence, so a feature, would run first. So if my threat intelligence detects and blocks a set of traffic, these won't get called. They can't override the threat intelligence. So when I think about the functionality, if I go and look at my firewall, notice I have this option for threat intelligence. Now I can run this in different modes. So threat intelligence is based on known malicious IP addresses and their domains. It's powered by the intelligence security graph that's part of Microsoft security. And what I basically do is I say, hey, look, what is my mode? So what is my threat intelligence mode? I've got it to alert and deny. So it will actually block that traffic if it's high confidence. Now I could just say alert only or I could disable that check. But this is going to run before those network or application rules. Now, I can override this in terms of the threat intelligence policy. I could say, hey, do not filter traffic to these IP addresses, these ranges, these subnets, or these particular fully qualified domain names. So I do have that option um, for the various configurations. But let's actually go back and think about these various types of rules and where we're actually using this. So let's think about my NAT rules first. So my NAT rule is all based around, hey, these, these public IP addresses. And when I think about that, that NAT, what's actually happening is that public IP can really do two different things. So one of it is, hey, I've got things coming in so that is DNAT. I am coming into one of my public IPs, and I then want to map that to something on the back end. Maybe I'm mapping it to RDP on a certain virtual machine. So for the DNAT rule, what we're actually having over here is my configuration is built around, well, where is that request coming from? So I'm going to think, OK, well, what is my source kind of IP? Where am I coming from? So it could be an IP, or it could be an IP group, remember? All of these things, I can use IP groups. And then what I'm going to map is, hey, which public IP of the firewall is it talking to? And port. And then I want to map it to what? I'm going to map it to a certain private IP and port. So it's just mapping it through. So if I was to go and look at my rules over here, and these, these are very simple. If I go and look at my DNAT rule, I've got two kind of configured here. I only have one public IP. And if I go and look at the rule, it's a rule name. So my source type is from an IP group. But again, that also could have been an IP address. So mine is home base. So if the traffic is coming from the IP addresses in that IP group, i.e. my home where I work from public IP addresses, I'm trying to go to this destination IP. So that IP address is the public IP address of my Azure firewall. If my Azure firewall had multiple public IP addresses, I could distinguish on which one. So I could have different rules depending on which public IP address I was actually going to. It's TCP. 
I'm using, hey, 13389. And I want to translate it, notice I could be an IP address or fully qualified domain name, to this IP address on my internal network, to 3389, i.e. RDP. I have a second rule, which is basically exactly the same, same public IP address at the Azure Firewall, slightly different port, and that maps to a different IP address on my private network. So it lets me get to different virtual machines within my environment by going to different ports when I RDP to it. So really all DNAT is doing is that very simple, hey, you're coming into this IP address, uh, I'll send you to that one. So that, that's really the whole point of that. So that's DNAT. Hey, stuff coming in, go to here. Now the other big important thing that obviously it is doing is, hey, I'm trying to actually go outbound to the internet. So that SNAT, source network address translation. So here it's using those public IPs and some of the ports to establish the connections actually going outbound. Now, it does not SNAT the traffic if it's going to an RFC 1918 uh, address block, i.e. those internally reserved. I can change that configuration. So as part of my Azure Firewall policy, if I go and actually look at private IP ranges, notice by default it's going to perform SNAP for all IP address ranges except RFC 1918. But if I wanted to, I could override that. I could say, hey, I want to do it for specific IP address ranges by unselecting that. And I could specify, hey, don't snap. Maybe I use a different IP range internally, so I, I want to not snap for those as well. So I do have configuration over that kind of snap behavior. Now, obviously, one of the challenges with snap is it uses up a port for every kind of unique connection. I can actually go to my um, monitoring. If I go and look at the Azure Firewall itself and look at its metrics, it does actually give me a metrics of SNAP port utilization. And you can see I'm basically doing nothing. <laughs> uh, I have a, a single machine really doing anything to the internet with this, so I'm really not struggling. But realize if you have a lot of machines using this, it, it's gonna be using those ports. Now I can add multiple public IPs. If I'm getting to this kind of SNAP exhaustion, I can keep adding more public IPs up to 250. That's why we can add multiple ones to handle kind of SNAP scale, and also for DNAT, so I can have more kind of incoming directions. If you are very large scale, another option would actually be deploying NAT gateway. So NAT gateway is that service designed to kind of uh, SNAP the traffic going outbound, and it's just more efficient with the public IPs. So if I do have this very large scale kind of SNAP requirement, you could consider deploying NAT gateway link NAT gateway to the Azure Firewall subnet, and then it will use that for the NAT. I don't have to do any other configuration. That will just work. So realize there is an option there as well. Okay, so that's DNAT. Um, that's those kind of rules we have there. The next type are the network rules. Remember, I had to have the network rule to enable these to be able to ping, because the default is to just deny now, a network rule is going to seem very, very familiar because a network rule is really just based around kind of the standard five tuples. So any kind of time you do a lot of configuration, uh, network security groups use the same kind of thing. It's really based around, hey, where is it coming from? So I have this source kind of IP port. We have kind of this protocol. And then we have this destination. Now again, I'm writing IP, it can be IP group. Destination can be kind of IP group. But there are also some other special things I can do here. I could also do a fully qualified domain name. I can also do a service tag. Now realize this is just um, really network, layer four. If I use a fully qualified domain name, it's really just resolving that to an IP address. So if I have different fully qualified domain names for the same IP, 
it's pretty, it's not going to do anything special based on that. Service tags, remember, are we use those in network security groups. I have a service tag that represents a certain Azure service and all those public facing IP addresses. Maybe it's global, maybe it's for a certain region. So this is a fairly standard set of configuration. If we jump over and look, so I can jump back, let's look at my policy, look at my network rules. So I created two. So the first one you've got here is called ping. And let's actually just look at the rule. We can see, hey, it's a name. My source is an IP group. And that's main USB net IP space. So that was those three different SIDAR ranges of so 10.0, 10.1, 10.3 slash 16s. So basically any of my known kind of IP spaces, and you can see my options are IP address or IP group. If it's going to an IP address, an IP group, a fully qualified domain name, or a service tag. So mine is, hey, it's basically coming from or going to my known space. The protocol, ICMP, any pool, allow it. So this is, I'm adding those kind of allows. Again, it's denied by default. So I'm going in and adding where I actually want to uh, allow these things. So that was that one. And then I added another one, which was the same sets of IPs, but 3389. But if I was to add another rule, notice in my destinations, if I picked service tag, here I would see all those different service tags for the different resource types, services in Azure. And then I'll see kind of for app service, the different regional ones. So I can control two of those different types of service uh, based on the regions. So we have those capabilities as well, just in there. And that's network rules. Again, nothing particularly exciting about those. It's really just built off of those kind of five tuples, but we have to go and add them. Now you can also see these, again, if I just look at my rule collections, if I just selected one of those, so hey, let's just go and look at my basic rule collection. Again, it's showing them just in here. So it's very easy to go and see those. And notice for the rule collection, you do have an action. So these are all allows. I could add a rule collection as well that maybe I, I've added a bunch of allows, but I have some more specific ones that I don't want to allow. So I could go and add kind of a deny as well, make sure I get the priorities right so those take effect. So the last one are application. So the application ones, this actually understands kind of a, a higher level, hey, we're doing these, for example, layer seven, we're accessing URLs, for example. So this is actually fully qualified domain name for my kind of HTTP, HTTPS SQL. And I don't have to do TLS inspection to be able to use um, the fully qualified domain name. What it's actually going to use is that server name indication. So the way this works is once again, my source, hey, IP, that source IP, IP group as my configuration. And then, hey, where is it going to? So here I can specify a fully qualified domain name. If it's premium, but only premium, I could also specify a URL. So that's kind of a premium only feature. And just so we're super clear, so what's the difference? So a fully qualified domain name could be www.savletech.com. That is the fully qualified domain name. The URL, the difference on the URL is, well, there's kind of HTTPS, whack, whack. And then it could be page something. So that's URL. So really the big difference between the URL is now I can make different decisions based on actually what I'm accessing at that site. If I'm just doing fully qualified domain name, all I know is the name. Server name indication, even with TLS, will tell me what the fully qualified domain name was. But I can't distinguish on the different types of content I'm accessing at that site. 
Whereas with URL filtering, I can actually look at the entire URL. And with premium, it's a premium feature, even if it's encrypted, if I've got TLS inspection, I can still distinguish based on those. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show that. That's a really cool feature. So that's the difference. Fully qualified domain name is in the URL, but the URL has extra stuff as well. So my application rule can be fully qualified domain name, um, URL. We also have these FQDN tags. So FQDN tags are created by Microsoft. They're for some of the well-known, actually, names for Microsoft services, like Windows Update. If we go and look at the documentation for a second, we can see, I can't add to these, but it shows the current tags. So there's Windows Update, Windows Diagnostics, and you can see these ones are included. So I could add these, actually, as part of my rules. And then finally, what we get as well is we can actually have categories. So we have this idea of this web category. Now, premium adds to this. So there, there's a basic functionality. And then premium, because premium can work off the URL, that does also add the URL part to the web category as well if you are premium. So it does build on that. So this is where, hey, there's this feed of information saying, hey, this site, this is a news site. This is a search site. This is a gambling site. Um, and then I can make my decisions actually based on those instead. And again, with premium, even if it's HTTPS, i.e. a TLS encrypted connection, it can still see the URL. So it can still categorize based on the full URL and use that. So these are actually very, very cool. Now, I don't have to do any special configuration on the clients for the application filtering. This is not a proxy that I configure in the browser or anything. Remember, my next hop is set to the NVA, so all of my traffic goes here. So when I'm accessing sort of a website, it's going to this Azure Firewall anyway. I don't have to do something in my browser to say, hey, go via this service. All of my traffic is going via that service anyway. In fact, we can kind of see that. So remember, the Azure Firewall has a public IP. So if I was to jump over for a second, so my Azure Firewall, it has this public IP, and I can see it's, hey, it's this 1384.211.61. Now, if I jump over to my virtual machine, and what is my IP.com? Hope this works. There we go. So my public IP is 13.84.211.61. Well, that should look very familiar. 13.84.211.61. 13.84.211.61. So all of my traffic is being snatted by that Azure Firewall. I can actually see that is happening. So then I can have, obviously, those, those application rules. My traffic is flowing via it. So if I go back and look at my policy, I now have my application rules. Remember, these are process last. And I have a number of different rules in here. So if we look kind of, we'll look at this, this one first. So this rule. This is based on URL. You can see here my drop down. I've got fully qualified domain name, tags, categories, and URL. So this one is only allowing this particular URL, and I am using TLS inspection. So even if it's an encrypted connection, I'm only going to be able to access that particular site. This rule. Hey, I'm using FQDN tags. Again, these are built in. I'm allowing Windows Diagnostics and Windows Update. This rule, this is based on web categories. And I've enabled, what have I enabled here? I know it's general, um, search engines, and computers, technology, and entertainment. But I'm not allowing, for example, news. So that's kind of an important, remember that. I don't allow news. Don't want anyone to know it. Um, Ignore those things. 
So those are the rules I have in place. Now, again, I'm mixing kind of premium functionality in here because when I'm looking at that TLS inspection, I'm using the URL, that's a premium feature. I could not do URL if this was just a standard rule. But I, I have these in place. And I'm going to kind of demo all of these in a second, actually seeing how this works, how it works with the TLS inspection, really making sure all of those things are actually working. Because again, that's a feature of premium. So I'm going to focus on that in a second. But that's the basic construct of actually what we have. Now you might notice here we have this DNS option. I can, well firstly, I could make it use a different set of DNS servers for the Azure Firewall. It doesn't have to use the Azure provided. I could point it to other DNS servers. But I can also then enable it to be a DNS proxy. Now you might wonder, why would I want Azure Firewall to be a DNS proxy? We'll realize uh, some of those rules are based on fully qualified domain names. So I can use kind of the, the FQDNs as part of those rules. Well, that fully qualified domain name maps to an IP address, which Azure Firewall resolves. So it's going to resolve to a certain IP. But if I have a client using a different DNS service, and it resolves that same fully qualified domain name to a different IP address, the rule is not going to apply the same way. I, I don't want inconsistencies between my DNS. So by turning on that DNS proxy, I can make sure the clients are going to get resolved the same way as Azure Firewall to make sure I get a consistent resolution, to make sure I get a consistent rule application. It also might be useful if maybe I had clients outside of Azure that can't directly point to kind of the Azure private DNS zones, well, the Azure Firewall can, because it's in Azure, then I could point other things to the Azure Firewall's proxy DNS, so it could then access Azure private DNS zones. So all of this, all of that configuration was all via this policy. I have those different rule types, I've configured them. Probably worth talking about Firewall um, Manager just very, very quickly. So Firewall Manager is all about giving me this central point for the management of my firewall environment. So those policies, remember I don't pay for them if it's only linked to one Azure Firewall, but I can go and actually see the overall configuration of my environment. So if I actually go and look at Firewall Manager, firstly it's kind of giving me, hey, you should go and create Azure Firewall policies and then add it to virtual hubs or virtual networks. A virtual hub, you're really thinking about things like Azure Virtual WAN. So I can secure that using Azure Firewall. So if I look at my virtual hubs, I've got Route Server. So it's kind of seeing that as that kind of hub. And it's saying, hey, you don't have a firewall deployed here. If I look at my virtual networks, it sees all the virtual networks and it's smart enough to say, hey, look, this virtual network at the bottom, yes, you have Azure Firewall. These others, hey, you don't have Firewall, but you're peered to a network that does. I.e., hey, you're in a good position from that configuration. So essentially, I can quickly go and see, hey, I've got my environment. I could go ahead and create a new secured virtual network from this menu. I can see all of my different policies that I have and actually drill down and edit them directly from here. So Firewall Manager is really about giving me that central point for the configuration. But again, remember, as soon as I apply a policy to more than one firewall, uh, then I start paying for it. Okay, so now I wanna get to the fun part. So that was basic functionality and it's cool. It, it, it's functionality I need. Then I talk about premium. So what does premium do? It is the same code base as standard. I talked about this already. It's built on top of standard. It is a more powerful VM SKU. So those VMs, I think with standard, it's kind of a D type, maybe a DV2. This moves to an FS series V2 for the premium SKU. Again, it only works with firewall policy. I cannot use classic rules. And there are a whole bunch of different features. Now, 
I can move from standard to premium. It's basically, if you think about it, most of the configuration is in the policy. So I don't have to worry about all of the rules as such, but there are things like the public IP addresses, uh, maybe UDRs. So what I would do is I would export the configuration of my standard, create my premium, and then bring that configuration. So let's talk about the features. Remember there were some limitations. TLS, encryption, is always painful for something that's trying to be in the middle. So if I am here try, talking sync over here, I, I can't see TLS traffic. Because remember, the whole point of TLS, if, if we think about what it's doing, if I have some server, so this is something I'm talking to, and then I have my kind of client. So the way TLS works is that server has a certificate. Now the whole point of that certificate, let's say this is Bing. So this is www.bing.com. And it has a private part of that and there's a public part. Obviously the public part everyone knows about. So what happens is when a client wants to talk to a server, it resolves a DNS name to an IP address, it establishes a TCP connection, and then it establishes a TLS session. So it establishes this TLS. And it basically works by, hey, this public certificate, this is asymmetric encryption, which is not very good for bulk amounts of traffic. But it uses this to actually establish an encrypted session where it can share a session key, which is a symmetric key, so it uses this to securely create this symmetric key and share it. And it's doing this because, hey, I know your public key, so I can send you kind of some information so we arrive at the same symmetric key that we'll then use for that session. So it's all based around this public key. And only after it establishes that TLS session does it actually start to send things like URLs. So I cannot even see the URL. That path that gets sent, I can't see that. We don't send that un until we have the TLS, and then we send the request over the TLS connection. So if I have this TLS, if I try and put Azure Firewall in the middle, and say, hey, I want you to kind of look at all the traffic, how can it do that? I have no way of looking inside that encrypted connection. I don't know what the symmetric key is. I cannot look inside that. So what we have to do is Azure Premium can actually do TLS inspection. So we have this TLS inspection. And the way it works is it becomes a man in the middle. But to be able to work, it has to be able to see the traffic. And again, we've already established it can't in this normal, natural order of things. So what we do instead is this gets in the middle of all of the communication, which it already is. Remember, we have that user-defined route. All of the traffic flows via the Azure Firewall. Again, I don't have to do anything special. UDR, it goes via this. And so it's in the middle of the communication path. So it's in the middle even of that initial communication path. So what we're going to do is the Azure Firewall is going to act as the gateway, this man in the middle. What actually happens is when we establish this TLS session I, using these different certificates, it's now going to get in the middle of that whole process. Now to make that work, we think about this is all PKI, public key infrastructure. Now, probably for your company, you have some kind of enterprise PKI. That enterprise PKI has kind of a root signing, like this root CA, which is the client, you have a whole list of kind of trusted roots. There's a whole bunch like VeriSign and there's some Microsoft ones in there, a whole bunch of them. Your enterprise root CA is probably in that trusted list as well. You have that there already. What we need to do is we need to give the ability for Azure Firewall to generate certificates. 
that the client will trust. And you'll see why in a second. So what we're going to do is I want a subordinate certificate authority, certificate to be created. So the enterprise is going to issue a subordinate CA certificate. Now in Azure, we have Azure Key Vault. This is this secure place for keys and secrets and certificates. So we have Azure Key Vault. So we're going to store that in there. So we create the subordinate CA. We're going to store that in the Azure Key Vault. Remember, that's made up of this public and private part. The Azure Firewall is now going to give permission to use it. And this is by a user assigned managed identity. So we're going to give the Azure Firewall this user assigned managed identity. And we're going to give that managed identity the permission to operate on that kind of certificate we're bringing in there. So now it can actually generate certificates for any name because it was issued by that enterprise root that I trust. When the certificate chain that this is going to create certs for, my client will trust that certificate because I trust the root. It's like me saying, hey, you trust me, and I say, Tim is trustworthy, so then things Tim tells you, you trust. It's that kind of chain of trust. So now what happens is, when my client tries to access bing.com, two sessions get established. So the Azure Firewall, using the bing.com public cert, it's like, okay, I'll establish a TLS session, and that symmetric session key with you. It will then generate its own certificate for www.bing.com. So then there's the public part there, and then obviously it has the private access via the key vault. So then there's another TLS session here, and you used this public key to establish. So now what does that mean? The traffic is encrypted, but the Azure Firewall can decrypt it. Look at it, and then encrypts it again to go to the destination. I can now actually look inside of that. There's a whole bunch of different configurations. I'm not going to go. The documentation is great. It goes through the step by step. But to really just kind of summarize, if I look at my policy, you can see I've got TLS inspection. And what you can see here is it's using a certain managed identity. So I created the managed identity and I assigned it to this Azure Firewall policy. I have that certificate which I stored in my particular key vault and I gave that managed identity permission to that certificate. Now, again, that certificate, let me close that for a second, is generated from my PKI. So if I go and look super quick. So I have my enterprise CA. You just go and request a certificate. Advanced cert request. And my type would be this subordinate certificate authority. Make sure you do at least 4096 for your key length. It's kind of an important part. And if you're having problems with this, make sure you have permission to enroll. So if I look at my certificate authority templates, make sure when you actually look at the properties, it didn't work for me to be part of the group. I had to actually add myself directly to have kind of the permissions. So I'd actually go and give myself the permission to enroll, write, and read. So if I look at me, I can see, hey, read, write, and roll. So you have to actually go and create the subordinate cert. Once you go and request and create that, you then export it out from the browser with the private key. So you can actually go look at my content. You can see I created a number of different certificates, but there was my 4096 one. So you just export that out and then bring it into Key Vault. So then that's there. And I can see all the different issued certificates I have. Now the key point is on the client, 
that's kind of the important part. Remember, it has to trust it. So if I look at the certificate snapping on my client for my local machine, you have this trusted root certificate authorities, and it's part of my domain. So you can see here, my enterprise signing cert is trusted by it. So along with global sign and DigiCert and all the others, it trusts any certificate issued as part of my chain. So let's kind of prove the point. So if I go to bing.com, actually make sure I'm doing HTTPS, which it will default to anyway, but let's just play this out. Bing.com, okay, it's encrypted. You'd expect that. Let's click the little padlock icon for a second. So interesting, right? So that's kind of weird that it's this cert authority is identified the site. If I view the cert, it was issued by Azure Firewall. Remember, it's in the middle. If I look at my certification path, yep, so there's my enterprise root CA, which issued a subordinate for Azure Firewall Manager CA, then Azure Firewall Manager CA created a cert for bing.com. So because my client trusts that, I can issue the cert and I can get to it. So this is probably the most amount of setup you actually have to do for any of the different functionalities. But once you've done that, I am now looking inside even TLS encrypted traffic. That's kind of the super powerful part. Now, within certain rules, like my TLS inspect, uh, my application rules, my IDPS, I can say, hey, do TLS inspection. So even for various types of traffic, go and look inside it. Now, this is gonna work for traffic kind of east-west. So east-west is kind of between things in our Azure virtual network. It's gonna work for things going outbound, out of the firewall, out to the internet. For inbound from the internet, it can do it if it partners with App Gateway. So you would deploy App Gateway, and then remember App Gateway sits in its own subnet, so the traffic from App Gateway then just looks like east-west. App Gateway can then actually do that decryption and forward it on unencrypted, or App Gateway could even re-encrypt it, but it would be a cert I know, so I could do that TLS inspection as well. So for inbound inspection, uh, we'd need to partner with App Gateway to actually enable me to do that. But once I've got that, I can now look inside all of that encrypted traffic. And, and I'll show that in some of the configurations. Now, the first thing beyond that, so let's say we've got this set up. And again, that's the most setup you're gonna have to do for Azure Firewall is to get that part working. But once you do, hey, I, I can now check a box and say, look inside the traffic. And you saw, hey, my Bing access or anything else is now using certs from my Azure Firewall. So now my Azure Firewall can look at all of the traffic. It can look at URLs, it can look at the content, the headers, everything. So that gets me onto the next feature of Azure Firewall Premium. That is Intrusion Detection Prevention System, IDPS. This works for plain text and encrypted text, and it's based on signatures. And um, there's a daily feed, I think it's about 35,000 of these different signatures today. And if the traffic matches, it can kind of alert you or alert and block. So if I go and look at my IDPS, hey, my mode, so hey, disabled, alert, or alert and deny, I could override it. So I could actually add signature rules. So for a certain ID, I could say, hey, disable it, do not check this one. Or I wanna do something different from the others. Or I could say, hey, for these, for a certain name, um, don't. So I actually want to bypass this. So do not filter any traffic to any of these particular ranges that I'm configuring here. So I can override if I need to. But that IDPS is, obviously it's stateless. This is not looking for any kind of ongoing communications. It has a signature base that matches based on the payload of the packet or the header of the packet, like SolarWinds, for example. So SolarWinds, um, had a specific signature that could have been blocked. Um, if I'm sending headers that have the malicious part, I can block that. So the IDPS, uh, there's a whole set of functionality there, again, plain and encrypted. 
The next feature of premium is actually URL filtering. So standard, remember, could do fully qualified domain names. And it could do that because even though I have that kind of encrypted connection, as part of that initial kind of client hello, it can send this server name indication, this SNI, this extra bit of info. So at least I know, well, what name are you actually talking to? So I could do rules on that. But premium adds the full URL. I can actually make decisions on that full URL, even if it's HTTPS, because I can do that decryption. It can support wildcards, and it's something I can actually do as part of the application rule. So let's see one of these. So what I have over here, if I look at my application rules, I'm going to have this Iron Brit events. So if we look at the rule, what I've configured here is it's a URL. So we can see that right here. I'm only allowing the ironbrit.com Ironman events completed, and I want to do TLS inspection. So it's HTTPS 443. So I'm very specific here. It's not just the, the site. It's actually only a specific part of the URL. So if I jump over to my client and type in that URL, HTTPS, it works. Fantastic. Okay. If I try and go to the main site, it doesn't work because I have no rule. It's understanding the URL. It's not just a fully qualified domain name, even though it's encrypted. It can actually go and see the full URL because it's sitting in the middle. And it's saying action deny, there is no rule. And again, if we went and looked at the cert, we'll see, hey, it was actually issued by that Azure firewall. That's how it can actually go and see the URL that is sent over the encrypted TLS. So that's very powerful that I can do that URL filtering just as part of that. Now, I could even go and look at the logs. Now, it takes a couple of minutes for logs to get to the firewall. But if I go and look at my firewall for a second, remember, I've got the diagnostic settings turned on. So if I look at my logs, there are a number kind of built in. But what I have pre-ready here is, so I'm looking at my Azure Firewalls type, application rules, I'm looking if it contains the iron brick. And if I run this, so it's showing me a bunch of different entries. And here are the, the ones we can see just running right now. Um, these two, and I think it's just coming in right now. But we, we look at it, we can actually see all the detail. So we can see this HTTP request coming from a certain IP, the iron brick, URL, the iron events completed. And if we keep scrolling, action allow. It actually shows us, hey, look, here's the actual policy, everything. I can see all of that just working. If we keep, again, it takes a couple of minutes to see if this one, that's probably parts of that same one. Oh, so there's here the, the deny. Perfect. This one, hey, the URL is just the Iron Brit, deny, no rule matched, proceeding with default action. So here you can see the actual URL filtering happening. So it's understanding that and actually blocking it. So that's part of that feature that's using, yes, the TLS inspection, but also the premium feature of URL filtering. So that's this. The next part is web categories. Now, again, for the web categories, it's a constant feed that gets updated daily, but this understands the URL as well with premium. And again, it can actually look inside that TLS encrypted session. So let, let's take a look at the web categories one. So here, I'm gonna jump over, and look at the premium, uh, sorry, the policy again, and we can see my application rule. I've got these allowed sites. And we can see my web categories I've got selected and I turned on some of them. 
So I've got computers, entertainment, not news, search engines I'm allowing, and I've got this TLS, oh, just turned it off accidentally, and I've got that TLS inspection turned on as well. So let's see that in action. So what I would expect is on my little site over here, if I go to google.com, that works, it's a search site. If I go to cnn.com, nope, no, it won't let me to that. What about if I go to google.com slash news, it won't let me to it. So it's using the TLS inspection, then it's using the URL as part of the categorization. So it's not just the name, the categorization feature uses the URL as well. So when I try to go to google.news, it's denying it because there's no rule allowing that through. My rule only allows search. It does not allow news sites. So I can now see, hey, that web categorization, that's actually treating that super, super differently. And I mean, just while I'm here, I kind of showed you some of the logging already, but there are a whole bunch of different kind of monitoring capabilities. If I go and look at the logs, there are different kind of rules available to me for the firewall. It says kind of firewall audit, firewall blocked request. There are firewall logs, application rule data, DNS proxy data, network rule log data, threat intelligence rule log data. There's a whole bunch of these just kind of built in for you. You can run these and it will show me the detail. Well, I'm actually in the wrong query, but they're all kind of built in available for you that I can actually leverage. Let me jump back out a second. Let me jump over here. So again, if we look at the different queries, so I have those firewall logs. Let's just look at application rule logs. So I can get all of the detail about all the different kind of things it's talking to. So huge amounts of data available to me. Again, there are metrics as well that we have available to us. Firewall health state, data processed. Again, not doing very much in my environment but we have these sort of pieces of information available to us. I'm still probably not doing anything on Snap. Yep, <laughs> zero percent essentially on my, my tiny configuration. But we do have sort of all this information so we can troubleshoot and actually go and see what is actually happening in the environment. So, so that was it. Um, that was kind of my deep dive into the Azure Firewall I really hope that was useful. Again, huge amounts of functionality, very simple deployment. Route tables tell it to send the traffic to the Azure Firewall. Obviously this can be from any kind of connected network could, could use this. Really the bulk of the power now is through the policies. We wanna use those, have to use it for premium, wanna use it for standard. Based around these rule collection groups and rule collections, but remember, Within those, it's DNAT rules first, then network rules, then application rules, based on the priorities within each of those categories. I have a lot of configurations I can use based on, does it make sense at layer four, layer seven? Premium, the big deal here is that TLS inspection. Some setup initially, making sure you've got the right certificates in place, but once I have it, I can now use that for kind of URL filtering, even if it's TLS encrypted. I have that intrusion detection prevention capability. I have the web categories that can be based on the URL, even if it's TLS encrypted as well. So it really adds a whole bunch of functionality to that. So with that, um, good luck in all your kind of Azure firewall endeavors. And until next time, take care.